Welcome to Memo Q Talks, where we talk to industry leaders about their experiences, lessons learned, and what works best across all areas of localization. Now, here's your host. Hey, Olivier, how are you? Very good, thank you, Hedova. Hey, so um, you can tell that spring has arrived here in Seattle. How are things in Paris? Well, in Paris today, it's, uh, it's nice and sunny as well. Uh, so it's fine. I can't show you exactly where I'm going to break my setup, but it's... Uh, That's okay. It's you have kind of, a sun, you kind of a sun-themed mirror behind you. So, uh, you know, it gives off the similar effect. Hey, um, we're going to be talking about the, the applications of machine translation or MT in the financial services industry. But before we do that, Maybe you can talk a little bit about your journey and how you ended up running a technology company that sells machine translation services to the financial services industry. Okay. Um, so I, I, I'm basically a, a former finance professional. So I've spent 18 years uh, working for companies such as uh, JP Morgan or AXA investment managers in different countries. So as you can hear from my accent, I'm French. So I started to work in France. <laughs> Uh, went to work in Germany as well. Accent, by the way. I wish I had a French uh, accent. <laughs> <laughs> does not always work. It doesn't, but, uh, so I worked, in, I worked in Germany. I worked in the UK as well. Uh, I ended up managing big uh, teams uh, across, uh, across different countries. And um, I've been, uh, you know, I've, I've been working with big corporation. I was very good at it. Uh, but I had this personal and diva of saying, well, if I reach one day the age of 60 and I haven't set up my own company, I think I will have failed my life because I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur and create my company at some stage. So uh, I've been looking always for a business ID. And this business ID came during the 2007 and 2008 financial crisis, where what happened is that if you put yourself in context, you are in a European office. So in Europe, there are many languages that are spoken. And usually, particularly in the financial industry, everyone speaks English on top of their native language. So what happened then is that we moved into a crisis communication situation where we had every day to communicate to our big institutional clients you know, what happened yesterday with such and such banks that went belly up and we need to tell them what's going on with our investment. And obviously, we need to make sure we respect uh, that uh, the equality of um, uh, investors, everyone has to have the same information at the same time in their own language. So which meant that you want to answer quickly to one particular request, but then you have to answer to the thousands of people who are invested in the same fund within half an hour in their language. So what was happening then is that even if there was no impact, you still had to write a, a, a communication saying there is no impact on this and this uh, aspect. Um, so what was happening is that basically I was calling my guys in Italy and saying, well, you know, I know it's not your job, but we have this translate in Italian for tw in 20 minutes. Uh, you are German, please do the same. You're Spanish, please do the same. You're Dutch, please do the same. And, uh, and that's how it started. And the following day, we were doing the same. So I started to look at these topics. And yeah, there's really something to do with this kind of pain point where, in fact, there's a lot of translations that are being done in-house within the financial institution. So I started to investigate um, this particular case. And I found out that, you know, it was not only a crisis situation, in, in crisis situation that this was happening. When you are working in a sales team, and you have to answer a request for proposal. Yeah, like you imagine you receive a 100 pages long document in Milan, uh, in Italian. So as a sales guy in Milan, you have to translate this in English to send this to the headquarter. There we are working hard, the RFP team is going to work hard to answer, uh, to answer and to, to prepare the answer. So your 100 pages document becomes a 400 pages long document in English. Of course, we're a bit late because we need to you know, agree on exactly the, the right answer, but want to give on a global point of view. And then two days before the deadline, you're going to send this back to Milan. And then you have the poor Italian sales guy who's going to say, oh, shit, this is the, the global guys. They've put all this. They did not take into account all the local context or for such and that part. Anyway, it all has to be in Italian. I don't have the time to send this out to a translation agency. I'm going to do it myself. And um, obviously, using Google Translate for this type of document is not very safe. Uh, because then you don't know where the information is going and answering an RFP is fairly um, uh, important. 
uh, and 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 you know it's, it's confidential information and um, and you have to be efficient and quick on this so that's how the idea came up at the time so we're talking 2007 2008 so I worked further on the on, on the project while I was working and in 2011 I founded so that's the beauty of being in France you can remain an employee and start to create a company at the same time uh, all this fully uh, formally declared uh, with the idea of saying we should do a kind of Google Translate that works for finance, which is safe and secure. And that was the basic initial idea. And that's how it all started. So, and, and in 2011, so you can imagine we were not that much talking about AI. So it was not that simple to hire people who had any knowledge about this. So I made the, the choice of uh, um, hiring young people, you know, really who were keen on learning different things, you know, computational linguist, a linguist and an IT developer and gathered them and said, guys, I have no clue how we're going to do this. I've heard that, you know, there's in this An honest boss. I like that. I like that. A boss that says, I don't know. <laughs> yes, no, no, it was true. So I told them, <clears throat> I told them, though, look, there is in, um, in Edinburgh, this university that has developed some, uh, that has written some paper on statistical machine translation. So it was the first levels of machine learning applied to translation at, um, at, uh, how would I say that, at uh, word level. So you were still translating word by word, taking into account the seven, six or seven words before and after. So it was working relatively well for the technical text between right. the languages that are close to each other, like French, English was okay. If you were starting to do English, German, that was becoming much more complicated because in German, you have parts of the verbs that are really far away in the sentence. And obviously it was absolutely not working for Asian languages. So, but that's how we started and that's how we learned how to do, how we developed this expertise because I, what I told them, I said, I, I said, look, I gathered hundreds and hundreds of phone prospectuses, uh, in uh -huh. French and English. So this is the raw material. This is the data. You go and look at what is the state of the art on statistical machine translation. We develop an interface to make this run and we need to have something that works much better than anything else that exists on the market on this particular type of document. So we choose where we're going to focus, what we're going to focus on. And that's what we've done. And that's how we started to, so it took us a, a little while. We got on the market only at the end of 2014. Uh, and that's at the time where I, I quit my corporate job and I engaged fully in the company to start to go and chase clients. And we, this is what we've done. We've developed, we, we've chosen a, a whole area of type of documents where uh, the lexic is different. So mm -hmm. you don't translate a font. If you, we're talking about asset management, you're not going to translate a font prospectus like you translate uh, um, a font management commentaries for the same font. You would leave in French, for example, you would leave many more English terms than in the font prospectus, where it's a legal document, everything has to be in French. Um, all those little variances. For equity research, it's a more telegraphic style. It's very different as well. If you're talking about corporate finance and annual report, you need to follow strictly the IFRS terminology. So we, we took something like, like all those different categories and we started to collect a lot of data. And the big challenge in all this is to collect the data and to clean the data and to prepare the data for the training of the models. And then that's how we, that's how we launched the company. Then we followed the evolution. We moved from statistical machine translation to neural machine translation in 2016, which allowed us to develop also the Asian languages. And, uh, in the meantime, we were also, um, developing, uh, customized engines for our clients. And the, the, also the big, so you understood that our selling point is to say we are specialized in the financial domain. So we are targeting banks as clients. And on top of that, uh, we are not using any clouds. So all the engines are trained on our machines, physical machines that I can go and touch. Uh, I know where they are. Uh, and also the models run on physical machines that are ours as well. And I know where they are as well. So and that's an important that's element for European for banks in for particular. For security, right? Exactly. And, and, and I, I want to come back to that. Uh, but first off, let me just do a, a quick summary. Um, first off, you, you always had this kind of underlying goal of creating your own business. You were fortunate enough 
though, that you could keep your regular job while you pursued this other business. And in 2008, we had the financial crisis. And I'm, I'm sure you've heard the famous Chinese expression that in crisis, or this, excuse me, the character for crisis is the same character for opportunity. Um, and so in English, we say in every crisis, there's an opportunity. And you found an opportunity. And uh, was it like about four or five years later, you it became commercially viable. I, I love the fact that you went out and found these people that, that, that wanted to work on this project with you. Um, and before we, I, there's several different areas I want to top, talk on, but you've already kind of mentioned it. Maybe you can talk a little bit more about the importance of industry knowledge. A lot of people look at finance or banking and they think of their little neighborhood commercial bank and they're like, oh, if translation, that means like account opening documents. And that's a very superficial kind of view of banking or finance. There are so many areas and you just mentioned a few of them like asset management, equity research. Can you talk a little bit more about the very specific uh, domains inside of financial services and the importance of industry specific knowledge if you want to sell into those domains? Okay, so indeed, that's one of the first thing uh, um, I've, uh, I've recorded a session actually for the new joiners in our company where I explain um, what are the various elements from the financial industry. So where it starts from indeed the retail bank you can see uh, in the street, which is really, they don't really use translation because they are local in general. Um, <clears throat> but in those retail banks, usually you can buy um, uh, some, they, they, they are going to propose you to have some savings, they're going to propose you some to invest in some funds. Okay, Those funds are managed by asset managers. Um, so those are really the companies who are gathering the money from different places and they're going to go onto the market through a broker. So that's another kind of uh, um, stakeholder. The brokers are those who are allowed to go onto the market and to do trades and deals. And they also produce equity research, credit research to uh, be competitive and propose that to the asset managers who are their clients. So the asset managers are in, invest, so they are investing the money of their clients, the end clients who can be gathered by the retail banks in specific funds. They need to, pro, to, to give uh, strict information on how do they invest? What are the rules and the guidelines that a fund is following? Where can, it, can, can I invest in, a, I don't know, a, uh, South American equities, or I can't, what are the, the control and the risk guidelines I'm following. So all this is written in a fund prospectus, which is a big document, which was too complicated. After the financial crisis, we decided to make summaries of this so that people could understand what they invest in. And it's a big topic on transparency of investment. So those type of documents have to be produced by asset managers. They also have to produce reporting on how they're performing. So that's another type of document that needs to be translated in a local language. I was talking earlier on about the portfolio management commentaries and answer questions from their clients. So that's that's already you already here I mentioned a few items. Then you have another kind of uh, uh, the, the money uh, and the, where this money is being held. Yes, the, the investment managers is not holding it it's in, own, in its own account. The money goes from a retail bank to the own bank account of a fund which is held at a custodian, another kind of stakeholder in the financial industry. The custodians are uh, the, the, the part of uh, what we call usually security services. Those are the, the, the stakeholders who are dealing with all the kind of operations related to the operations, making sure the cash goes well and that operations and trades are properly recorded and all the accounts are clearly uh, kept. And there, they have other challenges, those guys. They need, for example, if you are invested directly in shares, okay, you buy, you have some Coca-Cola shares. And um, tomorrow, so I'm not saying it's going to happen, but let's say Pepsi-Cola is buying Coca-Cola. Okay, big, big stuff happening. Um, your Coca-Cola shares are going to become, I don't know, maybe two or three shares of Pepsi-Cola or... Uh, half a share of uh, Pepsi-Cola, you need to give two shares of Coca-Cola. So this is a corporate action. 
you imagine the communication that all the guys who are holding the shares, i.e. the custodians, are going to need to do to all the holders of those shares and tell them, by the way, because you don't have to accept, you can say, okay, there has been a, 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 an operations taking place. Now your uh, 10 Coca-Cola uh, shares are going to, be, to become five Pepsi-Cola shares. Do you agree to a transfer? You have until such and such date to give your agreement. If you don't give an agreement to consider you don't disagree, it will be sold at that price. Um, so that's an example. And those, those kind of corporate actions, if you are a Japanese company, <laughs> okay? Yeah. You have that every day uh, because this happens because, every day. I mean, yeah, you're transacting business all around the world or people are doing inbound business and I, I, the mind is uh, like, oh. <laughs> yeah. how do we so, do this quickly? So, and that's, so that's just some so, of the areas. So, that's, so here you see in terms of stakeholders, you have yeah. the retail banks, asset managers or investment managers, the brokers, the custodians, and there's even there's another kind of actors as well, which are the private banks or the wealth management banks. So it's just a simple, a, a, a more sophisticated version of uh, a retail banks uh, when you have uh, bigger assets where they do a kind of intermediary, uh, kind of more, they can manage your own portfolio, but they're not asset managers directly. They have connections with asset managers and they have therefore also more communication to do they have well. very nice offices, is what they yes, have. As well, they, they have very yeah, nice offices exactly. and good espresso. Good you, espresso. <laughs> you, you see, you see where your fees are going. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And then after that, you have a completely different world also within the banking industry, which are all what is called the. Um, so in term, you you can identify because each big group, each each big big banking group, will have some little acronym at the end. So yeah. if you see security services, that means that's a custodian. If you see PB, that's private banking. If you see AM, that's asset management. So the name, like I was mentioning, I work for IB. asset investment managers. So that's yeah. asset management. Uh, brokers yeah. will have funky names. So that's uh, sometimes a bit harder to, uh, to, to identify. Um, we were, and, we were and, working and, with... Uh, in investment bankers, and that's IB. Because yeah, you know, yes, when you that, go in and, and that's, so, and that's uh, the last one I wanted to talk about is indeed IB, so or CIB, corporate investment banking. So it's a completely different world from the other one because here we're talking more about uh, corporate finance. Those are the guys who are uh, going to uh, bring companies together, help one to purchase another one or be sold to another one, and there you have all the due diligence documents. Uh, that are in the data rooms that need to be translated as well. Uh, because you see, if you go and buy a company in the Czech Republic, you know, the registration document and all the legal documents, everything is in Czech. So you need to have it in a, in a language that can be understood for the buyer. So that's a, yet another example. So it's, I apologize, I've been a bit long, but it's just to show the diversity of this world and the type of documents that need to be translated. But then after that, you have also have multiple use cases in each entity. Yeah, and I was going to say there there are more um, there are more some more sectors. I think you touched on the main one, main ones, um, but there are, in terms of use cases because you've been talking a lot about just the the investment related content. But in every bank, they have the operational content as well, like uh, you know, uh, learning and development guides um, that have to go out to every office where they have a location. And some of these international banks have offices in 60, 70, 80 different countries around the world. Um, you have, when I was at CLS Communication, we provided uh, machine translation services to one of the world's largest banks based in Switzerland. And you can probably guess which one of the two it is. Starts with a U, ends with an S. Um, but they were using the tool to translate emails on the fly. Um, and they didn't want to use an external like a Google Translate because of security reasons, right? Mm -hmm. So they used, a, you know, millions and millions of words every month. Be, you know, you're in Japan and something comes out from corporate headquarters and you want to know, is this something that I need to think about or is this something I can just, okay, it's done, right? And and of course, if it's, if it's something serious, then maybe you can send it out for human translation or have somebody edit it, et cetera. But there are, like you said, a lot of different use cases. Yeah, no, in-house in -house documentation is indeed something which is big in terms of all the compliance brochure, 
all the rules and guidelines that need to be followed <coughs> and, the, and the internal communication. So, and we have specific challenges. So we have clients where we trained engines based on their in-house procedures just to make sure that, you know, when, when you describe the name of a system or the name of a team, you know, is the team, uh, if a team name is, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, risk, uh, uh, the risk control team, let's say, okay. Yeah. That's the risk control team. You need one of those. Everybody how, should have one of those. <laughs> how, 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 do you, how do you call the risk control team uh, in German? Is it still risk control team in English or do you translate it in German? So, and there you will see, and then after that, you know, if you have to report to the global head of fixed income, okay, <laughs> how do you say global head of fixed income in French? That can be yeah. also global head of fixed income. It can be responsable mondial des taux, responsable mondial fixed income, uh, global head. Uh, you see, you, each house has, well, will have its own. Uh, and that's the complexity of those procedures where it's important to kind of fine tune well an engine. You need to fine tune. So some of the companies we worked with in Japan, they would use the kanji, the, the, the very complicated Japanese characters for real estate. Um, and some of them would use katakana, which is phonetical, and it would say real estate, though. you know, and, 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 and it's a bank by bank and sometimes department by department if they don't have corporate top down style guides um, or, or uh, what, what I'm thinking about uh, glossaries. Let me ask you this, uh, because I, I think you've really demonstrated how important one, that, that industry knowledge is, and it's not just banking industry, it's these, you know, these very well-defined verticals. What are, the, what are the best applications or where are you finding the best, easiest applications for machine translation? Okay. <clears throat> there are, um, there are if, you, if you go one step uh, where you, you look at the big functionalities, why do you need to translate? You need to translate to understand. You want to understand what you're going to invest in. You want to understand if your clients are not fraudulent. Uh, you want to understand all those type of things. So for that, machine translation is really ideal. Okay, because you just want to understand, you know, this is this, you know, there's this information in Chinese, what the hell does it mean? I want something which is fairly reliable that will work well. Uh, so something which will be particularly well fine-tuned for the type of documents I'm checking for, you know, KYC, you know, your clients, procedures, all those type of stuff. So that's to understand. Then um, another use case for um, uh, this in the, within the, or particularly, it's not for machine translation, but, that's, but particularly for us, it's security within banks. You know, banks are obsessed about data leakage. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, is confidential information going to go out. So I'm not comfortable to use a Google Translate or something which is public and free. And therefore I need a solution to prevent people from using those tools, which could, you know, have data being leaked out. So that's where, where there's a nice um, business for companies like us. Uh, and we have clients like this where all the employees have access to our platform. Uh, to prevent that. Um, then I, I was mentioning the um, kind of urgency uh, mm -hmm. uh, use case, which was the first one that I told you about. You know, I have this crisis communication. I need to go very quickly. Um, so there is this, uh, uh, this is a very good use case for all the teams who have urgent stuff to do, communication team, sales team. Um, you know, that's, that's good. Uh, that's very good. You know, good, good use case in the same way as for understanding this concerns many people. This can concern all the employees in Japan to understand what the hell is uh, headquarters talking about, uh, as well as uh, the research and uh, analysts, the, the analysts in the analysts in the research team to understand what this uh, uh, German company is, uh, has just launched. Um, you uh, can also you also have another uh, use case. Uh, is that you also have uh, financial institutions who have translators in-house because um, in general, uh, there is not enough human translators who have the ability to really do both financial technical translations. And that's also a, a core element to have in mind uh, is that there was also the case which where we came in uh, where um, 
the feedback we had, the pain point we had is that, you know, we had all those texts to translate, we sent it out. And there was a big surge at that time for those kind of documents because it, if it's regulatory driven, everyone is going to come up with the same thing at the same time. You will not have enough expert translators to do it. So therefore, the legal guys, uh, we have legal teams as client also, um, who will do the back and forth between English and their native language themselves uh, using our tool. Uh, that's another kind of use case as well. When you are in this situation, um, so they are, they, it may not be that there are there may not be internal translators, uh, but that's really a case that address also not in an urgency, but where we know that there's a problem to externalize it. Or also we have the in-house translators and there they use it like a translator would use machine translation to be more efficient and to go quicker. And finally, there's uh, a use case which is on the rise uh, at the moment. Uh, thanks to all the, the noise around ChatGPT and the large language model technologies that are now uh, under, uh, you know, the projector, uh, because this made people realize how much progress those technologies have done. What mm -hmm. does that mean? It means that for certain type of um, documents, like I was talking about the fund management's commentaries, you know, it's every month the same thing. You're going to comment about the market. You know, how's your portfolio has been uh, uh, behaving. Uh, and for those type of documents now, uh, when an engine is well trained for those kind of reports, you can almost uh, rely on pure automation. So not having proofreading on this. And uh, so that's, you know, you need to be cautious in terms also of the formatting. Uh, you see, when, when uh, cl our clients are using our platform, you know, that they can access, we, deal, yeah. they, we have to deal with two challenges, the format of the document and the translation. And all you, you have all, even in a Word document, you have plenty of tags that are hidden everywhere that can create, that create additional challenge for a translation engine. If you are in a, in a real production mode where you have systems where you write directly your phone management commentaries in text, you go directly by API to an engine, to, to, to our engine, and you come back uh, with the text and back. There's no formatting issue, and it works really well. And that's that's mm -hmm. that's the new uh, case which is going to increase where for for all those kind of you know the documents where we feel that uh, obviously you you test for a few months, you check you know do we need to is there a need for post edition or is it okay like it is, and also. Of course, it depends on the sensibility of the do of the document. If it's something you need to send to, I don't know, a court uh, for a legal document, obviously you're going to proofread it. Okay. If we're talking about uh, standard reporting, which is being sent, put on a website, and uh, we want to make sure it's correct because you know we want to respect, you know, obviously our clients. We don't want to have stupid mistakes. Um, you know, you this, know uh, this, this kind of... what I like about your answer is I, I've always looked at it um, from a document type or content type. So I, I, in my brain, when I was selling translation, it was, oh, we're selling equity research because, and they have this kind of need um, or we're, we're translating pitch books. You didn't mention document type and industry so much there. What you did is you say, if a customer has a need for security or if a customer has a need for speed or if a customer has a need because there's no resources so you're looking at the need and and as opposed to the 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 type of bank or document first and i think that's that's very interesting i'm sure you've heard the old um saying in in the translation industry the pricing model you, the the three-legged model you can either get low cost uh and uh but then you're going to either have to have poor quality or low slow turnaround times uh, but you can't have low cost, high quality, and fast turnaround times. You can't have all three. And I published an article in Multilingual about a year ago saying that with machine translation in certain areas, you can actually have those three legs and a fourth leg, which is security. And I want to talk to that in a second because you can have low cost in the, in the right domain with the properly trained engine. Uh, you can have low cost. You can have very fast turnaround times. Uh, you ha you can have good quality because if if you know if the if the tr engine is trained well enough, you sh quality should not be an issue in certain domains. But you also can have that security. So, can you talk a little bit about 
the security concerns, both from your customer's point of view, and then if there are any kind of regulatory guidelines that you need to adhere to as well, in terms of where data is hosted, etc. Yeah, obviously, in terms of uh, for the financial industry, um, it's an important point. I was, you know, asking myself at the beginning because we we kind of when we launched the company and we got created, our culture straight away from the beginning was. Uh, AI was not the big word at the time. I was calling us, we are a machine learning company. Okay, we, that's, okay. that's our core skill. We are not an IT company because we are really more focused on you know, training models on a statistical basis and, and doing really it. AI, which is very different from pure IT, where you have developers who are going to develop applications, who will be able to do a, a, a project and to go and set up something at someone else's, in someone else's infrastructure. So from the beginning... Um, we decided, and it was a strategic choice at the beginning, which was a bit dangerous, I would say. <laughs> we decided not to set up on premises at our clients, but to only be SaaS based on the condition, obviously, that there would be no cloud involved. So that would be hardware, you know, hardware, you know, servers, physical servers under our complete control. And that, that was the thing. And that did work. Um, also, uh, there's an element of insurance which only applies to um, to European banks. Uh, you know, we are based in France here. Uh, big French banks uh, all had huge fines in the US, uh, and those fines were used by leveraging emails that were were kind of I would not say hacked, but in fact they were, uh, because of the infrastructure they were using. So uh, it's somehow also reinsuring for our... Okay, we don't set up on premises, but our data centers are based in, in France, in continental Europe, uh, and uh, it's just between us and them. There is no um, you know, possibility... <laughs> of uh, recourse of the Patriot Act. Yes, the Patriot, the Patriot Act cannot apply to what goes in our system. So I, I know it, it, may sound, it may sound a bit odd seen from your side of the Atlantic, but, uh, you know... Not, not, not at all, not at all. Uh, I, I do a fair amount of consulting in the cybersecurity space. I understand um, a bit about, you know, regulations like GDPR. And in the US, we have a mixed mash of a bunch of them. But I deeply understand the concern for most European banks. Sometimes they don't even want to deal with American customers. Uh, you know, you talk about private banks. When I was in Singapore, most private banks in Singapore, they would not touch an American because even just having one American customer would give the uh, U.S. regulators access to the bank. And they were like, no, it's not worth the hassle. Um, but then the whole data hosting, uh, you know, most European companies do not want their data uh, hosted in, in North America data uh, farms. So, yeah, totally get it. So, this creates a lot of constraints uh, yeah. because obviously we have never used AWS to train our models. Uh, we invested in, uh, in big GPU servers ourselves uh, at the time, at the beginning of a neural uh, machine translation evolution uh, because at the time there was no other providers, in fact. Uh, we had to buy the machine. And even buying the machine was hard because there was a hard competition on, uh, on getting the, the hardware. Uh, so now, you know, there has been the development of a kind of sovereign offering. Uh, around here as yeah. well. uh, but at the beginning, it was a bit challenging. So, so what are the trends in terms of, you know, where is machine translation going? Is it, is it somehow uh, leveraging... Uh, large language models? Is it, um, you know, adding on connectors or making uh, tools like PDF extractors or, you know, where are things going? Is it just making the engines much more accurate? I mean, is, or is it all of the above? So there, there is uh, still um, um, the question on how, you know, because there's still the definition, you know, Mark, what is a good translation, you know? <laughs> I'm asking you, what is a good translation? I've been discovering okay. this whole now, universe. Now we're getting all philosophical, man. <laughs> no, no, but you see, I've been discovering this, this universe uh, more than 10 years ago now. I still haven't found an answer. Uh, 
because a good translation for you may be a bad translation for someone else. Uh, and, and, and you know, it is uh, so, um, uh, it's, it's so, it, it's, it's really one of the hardest problem to deal with. Uh, and why and that's the reason why this is the initial usage of AI. It's because it's really a problem that does not have one answer. When uh, even when you're dealing when you're dealing with speech to text, okay, you're going to use also some uh, so you can use some AI models to do that. But it's much simpler because you only have one solution to your problem. Okay, you you you're going to say something. You're going to transcript it. There's no there's no 10 possibilities to put the transcript. Whereas for a translation, there is. You can have five translations that will all be correct, but they may be assessed differently depending on who is looking at it. So that's really the, 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 the big challenging uh, item of translation in itself. So for me, the definition, because I still had to take the definition of so what is a good translation. So a good translation, uh, is a translation that answers the need of a user. Okay, mm -hmm. it may be completely inappropriate for someone else, but for that one, it's good. So you will have always a need for personalization. That's an important mm -hmm. item. So there's a lot of research that has been led on how to integrate glossary into a translation done by you know in an empty. This is a very hard problem. It sounds stupid. Okay, but it's very hard to mix rule based and machine learning element in the same thing. So that's a, that's a kind of tough element. So that's one of the development. It's, it, you know, DeepL has been working on this. Um, they, have, they are proposing an offering. It's not working 100%. Huh? We, we tested that, uh, and we, we've done some research. We published research paper on that topic. Another topic of research where we still need to progress is that today we are still translating at a sentence level. Okay, we may take into account a few sentences before or after. Uh, and, and you know, my, my, uh, my lab and my research team say, well, yeah, Olivier, we found a solution to translate at a document level. I say, oh, that's great. So uh, here is a 300 pages document. I say, ah, no, uh, that's for one page. I say, well, one page it doesn't work. <laughs> it's going to be useless because if you have to translate a, a, a contract, you know, what happens in a contract? On the first page, you're defining the terms. So if uh, you say by a client, uh, we mean this, uh, so client with a capital C, uh, and client in French, you can, trans you can translate, you know, if, it's, if the word in French is client, you can translate it in English as client or as customer. So you have to make sure that on page 49, uh, the way you translated it on page one is the same one on page 49, you see? So today... Yeah. We are not there yet. No one is there yet. So that's still one of the topics for improvement. Plus, so it's all related also to the personalization because you're going to have some clients who are going to tell you, I oh, know, but wait a minute. Me, I want diversity. I want to make sure that all the words are, are not, all the synonyms, we are not always using the same words. But we, because it's not a legal document, so it's more marketing. So I want to use different terms all the time. I don't want repetition of the same term. So even if the source text, it's always the same word. In the translation, I want something different. And on top of that, please, because French is longer or German is longer than English, can you make sure that it fits on one page? Okay, because the English source text is in one page. Okay, so you see, you, you have all those nice little challenges that are still there. You know, how do you adapt the size of the, of the target text uh, for for translation? Is another is another topic. And then coming back to your point on large language models, which is more uh, fundamental as per the technique in itself. Um, large language models have been there for a while. Uh, it's uh, <coughs> ChatGPT has really put a big you know, project <coughs> the lights on, on this. The, the, the idea is that you have those large language models and with those large language models, you can now do a lot of things uh, uh, by uh, training uh, 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 you, training applications to do automatic summarization, sentiment analysis, chatbot like ChatGPT, and machine mm. translation as well. So uh, the next move will be for all the companies who are involved in NLP, suddenly we're going to become competitors. You see, today, mm. 
If you look at, you know, today we are in a vertical where we are providing machine translation to the financial industry. And I had other companies who were doing text generation for the financial industry, other who were doing sentiment analysis for the financial industry. They were not direct competitors. But now uh, we are all focusing uh, on uh, using those large language models uh, and the industry is going to reshape itself uh, because uh, we are all suddenly going to be able, if we master that properly, if we manage to, you know, ChatGPT is a huge la language model, you can do better stuff if you are targeted with smaller ones who are also easier to use and cost less money. So this is feasible if you master that properly. And then you can offer many different services like this that are all NLP related based on that technology. And that's all how the market is going to reshape itself. This is, you see, how we're progressing on ourselves. On, on, for, on our side, we're looking a, a lot at data extractions and, uh, and are starting also to look at uh, generating reports automatically, uh, those kind of, those type of topics, because we've been working on those uh, LLMs. In fact. So that's, this is a, a big impact. Uh, that we're going to see. Uh, the, the usage will remain the same. You know, we still be talking about machine translation and so on. It will need to be always more and more personalized and finding a way to personalize it always more and more. Um, but in the back, there is, I think, a big change we're going to see uh, on this, which is going to be very exciting and interesting. That's uh yeah I mean you're in a, an amazing space at an amazing time right now so it's uh it's it's very exciting. I'm just curious like when you work with your customers or do you say clients um do you provide them one engine per company or is it an industry specific engine is it a company specific or is it even a department specific or do you can you do you have multiple different deployments for some customers so and how do you that all clean and consistent at the same time yeah yeah so we have um, more than 150 different uh, machine translation engines uh, for different type of documents different type of uh, context uh, different languages of course as well and on top of that we customize engines for some departments at our clients um, uh, a legal department is not going to translate things in the same way as a communication, marketing, or sales department. Um, right. So we can end up on our platform uh, with 300 users within an institution. With some of them, we use our off-the-shelf engines because they are not in the scope of a customized engine. Some of them will have, we've, we'll have had their own customized engine being, uh, being developed. And all this in order to make it simple, because uh, we renewed completely our platform last year to make it simpler, because before we were asking the user to choose the engine they wanted. So it became mm. unpractical, to say the least. Yeah. So we are really suffering from the typical French engineering company default uh, here. So now we've developed a classifier. So the user just put the document, we're going to recognize what type of document it is, select the best engine, and it's invisible for the user. So it's in back. And that's that's, how, that's, that's how awesome. It works. Yeah, I mean, I, I like that for a couple of reasons. One is a lot of users are reluctant to go through this and they don't know the right category or the classification. Uh, so you're, you're, you're saving them the time, the energy, the frustration but it's also probably more accurate because, you know, whenever you can get humans out of the loop, <laughs> yes, exactly. just say it, you know? Yeah, exactly. No, um, for, for that reason, it's indeed more accurate to do it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you, what advice would you give to an LSP owner that wanted to use machine translation for some of their customers that are in the finance space? Okay. That's a pretty specific question, but there are LSPs out there and they're, have tr traditionally done things, uh, you know, human translation, especially, especially, especially in finance where that subject matter expertise is hugely important. Um, but there's a lot of LSPs who are getting pressure to adopt MT because, you know, their customers are saying, Hey man, we, we, we've got more content. We want to reduce costs. We need to improve turnaround times. There's also the security issue, blah, blah. I'm an LSP owner. What advice would you give to me in terms of selecting an engine and how to adopt it and deploy it all that? 
So, <clears throat> first, I believe uh, that um, you can use machine translation for really a lot of content in the financial industry. Of course, there are still limitations. You know, what are the key limitations for machine translation still today? Um, a marketing title, that's the hardest yeah. thing you can imagine. You know, if you have a, um, a US bank, which is going to do a title on, you have seen that, huh? uh, even for a, a reporting on something, and they're going to make a reference to baseball. And you translate, exactly. you want to translate it like this in French. Okay. No one knows, but, you know, we don't know what baseball is. Yeah, you know, we think it's uh, So I, did, I don't know if you know uh, Tom Clancy, the author, he made a movie called Clear and Present Danger. And I, I, re I remember this. We had an English language equity research uh, report, and the title of it was "Clear and Present Danger," which is a clear kind of uh, you know, it's it's referencing that 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 famous movie, and it's also talking about there is a clear and present danger in these markets, okay, or with this with these equities. And our Japanese translators are like, what do we do with this? Because in Japan, they changed the name of the movie to something completely different. So, and, and, and the, the new name of the movie, which people recognized, didn't imply uh, that sense of urgency and danger, right? So he, they were like, what do we do? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, yeah. so typically, you know, it's not going to be so, this type of problem is not going to be sorted out tomorrow, okay? That's, that's really, that's really a tough one because even for a human person, as you were saying, it's very hard because you need to find a kind of similar reference. It's really creativity we're asking for here. It's even a generation of text. It's really creation and full, you know, uh, that's where, thanks God, you know, there's still space for the innovation brought by human beings on, uh, on, uh, on all this. And there is a space for all the translators, uh, on, on that. Um, because there will, there, there, there will always be this kind <clears throat> of limitation for those kind of texts. But coming back to your question on uh, how to, for an LSP, um, implement uh, machine translation, <clears throat> I would, I would uh, recommend to uh, uh, have it, you know, using specialized machine translation, ideally customize it as well. Uh, we have some, um, we, our, the, the base of our clients are, um, are financial institutions. We are starting now to open because we are now connected with MemoQ. Yeah. So we have some, um, some, uh, MemoQ uh, clients, uh, who, uh, have developed, um, engines, uh, client based. We, we develop for them client based engines, uh, yeah. but they are using, uh, Via, via MemoQ, obviously, you know, you do the proper process of applying your uh, translation memories first. Then you call, uh, <clears throat> you call for a machine translation, which is in itself customized. And then there is a, a, a feedback loop at some stage to retrain on a regular basis when there is enough content, uh, the models. So I can, it's, let, me, let me ask you this, because I hadn't thought about this before, but you're selling directly to financial institutions. You're also providing services uh, behind the scenes for LSPs. Is that correct? We're just we've started this recently. Yes. Any any concerns from LSP owners in terms of you know in some in some s scenarios you may be the competition in some scenarios you may be the trusted partner. How, how do you work through that? This is a, a, a psychological conundrum, indeed. Uh, but. Uh, that uh, has to be dealt with. We are um, we are selling a, a technology. We are selling a platform uh, to access a translation tool. Um, mm -hmm. This is not addressing the same need as um, people who will want to have a human review uh, and who will not, you know. I was, I was mentioning the Europe, continental Europe, where people are right. bilingual by definition uh, in, the, in the financial institutions. If you go to the US or to the UK, uh, it may be a bit more complicated to have people who master uh, the Dutch language in-house. So you still need, in any cases, to, you, know, you need to have a proofreading on this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not, uh, it's not at all... Um, it's, 
it's not it does not answer the same kind of need that I was describing before. Um, you know, machine translation does not provide certified translation either. Uh, right. Uh, and also, you know, there, there is those flows where you need, you know, like the marketing example you were mentioning before, you will yeah. have those kind of creative texts where you will always need someone to proofread it. Then the question is, is there someone in-house to do it? And is it is the benefit of doing it in-house uh, enough uh, in terms of size? So we have some, we have also some clients who are saying, you know, if the document is less than three pages, uh, we're using uh, uh, your platform. If it's more than three pages, we externalize uh, because yeah. we consider that we don't want to spend too much time on, uh, on uh, if it's not urgent, you know, we're, we're going to do it that way. So you see, it's after that, each each client is finding its way. You, uh, we have to keep in mind that all those AI solutions remain a way to enhance the user. The user can yeah. be a translator. It can be a final user who is not a translator, but who's got a need and who understands the language and who knows what he wants. So yeah. makes makes sense. And I and I having worked with um, a, a lot of different banks around the world in in the context of providing translation services, I know that more often than not, they they kind of like working with an LSP that can take care of all of their services, not just machine translation, not just interpretation. For example, they, they want somebody that, hey, they know their customer and they, they can go with the two repeatedly. So in certain scenarios, I mean, I think the LSP would, would have the advantage over the technology providers in certain areas. Sometimes the customer just wants to buy the technology and I, and I get that. So uh, let me go back and ask another advice question um, because, you know, MT is really affecting the role of translators going forward. You know, you got a kid right out of university and they say, Hey, I want to be a translator. What advice would you give them to be competitive and relevant, giving the increased velocity of adoption of tools like chat GBT and machine translation, regardless of what, what the underlying technology is. I, I think, you know, you need to do like, uh, like uh, judo on this. You need, you need to embrace technology. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, so I'm not a translator myself, so I can't talk for, 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 for that aspect. But uh, we, uh, we have met those, some, some translators who very early at the time, you know, when, when I discovered this world, you know, back 10 years ago, and I started to discover this world precisely, I was going to those kind of congress of translation agencies and translators, I thought I would not come back alive from this uh, when I was saying I was developing machine translation engines. But, but that was a very risky experience that I had there. <clears throat> and I, I saw that too as well when uh, uh, I was talking to uh, translators who were saying, you know, my job is to translate text, not to check something that has been produced by a machine. What if it's produced um, by another human being? And, and, and the, well, yeah, is that okay? Well, okay, but but I because I, you you often well we we would have documents we would always have a round of QA because some of these documents they had to get it right and then there are there are all kinds of workflows like li li linguistic validation for example where you have two translators translate something and then you have people check those translations select the best one. If, if, if a person's willing to edit or check a document from another human, why would they be reluctant? But it's this mental thing. Oh, it's a machine. Oh, look how low you've put me. You put me below the machine. And <laughs> Anyway, go ahead. My caffeine is kicking but, in. But, you know, this said, uh, there, is no, there, there are also, you know, we saw early adopters. I had uh, people coming, translators coming to us very early uh, at the time and saying, oh, you know, I would like to... Um, I would like to test uh, for annual reports. You know, I was translate. I am an indi individual, uh, you know, freelance translator specialized in annual reports for companies. And the issue I have is yeah. that I have to refuse work because it usually comes at the same time, and I'm too slow if I do everything manually. I would like to test uh, and to measure how quickly it made me. Uh, it, it, it improved my productivity for the same level of quality. I don't want to obviously reduce the level of quality. And, and 
it was very interesting for us because we were just launching at the time. We were sort of rolling out our first engines for annual reports. And, um, and this person really measured everything and came back, coming and back, saying, I actually, I moved from uh, uh, two and a half thousand words to uh, six, seven, six thousand words, seven thousand words per day, wow. eight thousand words. Uh, as we were improving the, the stuff and, uh, and ended up working a lot with that person actually after that to, uh, to, to develop, to test and, and, and so on. But you see, it's a, it's an, it's a question of there, there will always be a need because uh, as you were saying about a, a discussion I had, you know, um, translating a, a, a prospectus, a 250 pages technical prospectus for a fund is not translating the latest literature produced by a famous, uh, yeah. you know, um, writer, uh, where, you know, obviously you, you should not use machine translation for that purpose. Uh, and I think for me, you know, if I was, if my, one of my kids was to be a translator today, what I would say is I would say two things. I would say really get specialized in one area that you love and embrace technology. That's, that's the two kind of advice, piece of advice I would give. Uh, because also, you know, when, when I receive, because even if we don't use individual translators, we sometimes receive applications because in, we are in the language world. And I see those people who are specialized in, uh, in finance, but also in automobile, uh, in the medical area, and they can translate in three languages in all directions. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just not credible. Uh, so I think that's some, some great advice. Find out what you're interested in it and specialize in that. Um, just go do a deep dive, be, be super curious, you know, learn and whenever possible, find out how you can leverage technology. Olivia, I really enjoyed this conversation. I, I have a feeling that we could probably talk for several more hours, um, but I want to be sensitive to your schedule. It's getting late in the, in the, in the, in the evening for you in Paris. Uh, Thank you so much for coming on MemoQ Talks. And if our listeners or viewers want to find out more information about you or connect with you or more information about your company, Lingua Custodia, what's the best way to do that? So they can send us an email at contact arrobas linguacustodia.com, contact at linguacustodia.com, just simply or just uh, uh, the easiest thing is, uh, is to ping me on, uh, on uh, LinkedIn as well. Awesome. I'll put uh, that information in the show notes. Also put a link to your, your homepage. Again, thank you so much for being on MemoQ Talks and I'd like to wish you uh, an amazing remainder of 2023. Thank you, Mark. It was a pleasure and enjoy the sunny day uh, in the US. I am. I'm probably going to go put some sunscreen on right now. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. Thank you. Thank you for joining Memo Q Talks, where we talked with industry leaders about their experiences and lessons learned to gain new insights about what works best across all areas of localization. Join us next time on Memo Q Talks. 